I'm John Gross, and I realized I had a memory problem five years ago. It started like this. I went out the house, I locked the door, got in the car, went to the top of the hill, and took off. That happened for a week. And then the next week, I got up, I went out, locked the door, got in the car, went to the top of the hill, and I started to think, did I lock the door? So I went back, and the door was wide open. And the memory problems got worse and worse and worse. I'm Lori LeBay. People refer to me as an expert from Oprah, Maria Shriver, Dr. Oz, and even AARP. But the true experts are people like John Gross and my mom who lived with the disease for 30 years. Two of the most feared words for seniors is Alzheimer's and dementia. Hi, I'm John Gross and our guest is Lori LeBay. She has a podcast that's picked up all over the world and she has over 150 videos on YouTube. Lori, great to have you here. Can you put some focus on dementia and Alzheimer's and help people that fear it? That's my life's goal. That's my purpose. After my mom got dementia, she started having symptoms when she was 55 and she lived till 86. And that journey really was the biggest gift I'll, I'll ever get in my whole life. And so now I'm dedicating my life to, to share what she's taught me through this experience, which has really been about beautiful connections, prioritizing your life, keeping things simple. And uh, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. It's an incredible honor to do. So she taught you memories. And when she started out in this, it probably it, it's a slow moving thing. What was it like at the beginning? Was there any, any, any warning sign that you saw? Um, she started to pull in. My mom was always really social. And so she started not being as social. She stopped driving. Um, she started watching only one channel on TV, which we found out was how she was telling time. Um, so there were really slight little changes, but she also had, um, she also was working and she carried a, a book with her, kind of a three ring binder in case she missed any steps, she would have something to refer to. And she would carry that back and forth because she did not want people at work to, to know she had this, this binder to assist her, to prompt her. So um, because my mom was so social, um, you know, all of her life, she was really good about workarounds and adjusting to new situations. I worked at Channel 5 KSTP for 17 years, and I did three stories with, with Lori, and one of them was on the mom. And what touched me is you talked about her answering the phone and how she answered the phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a lot of times she wouldn't know where the phone was or she'd hold it upside down or she couldn't answer the phone at all. I mean, that became very foreign as the disease progressed. You don't recognize objects and even though you use them every day, you know, mm. for, for all of your life, they just become foreign. And so that was, again, another clue to our family that there was something off. But she knew, and she told my dad, and she told myself, everyone else she kind of kept hidden from. Lori has given speeches all over the country, including week-long speeches and panels. October 10th, she was honored by AARP Minnesota as a 2018 disruptor and accomplished leader. Oprah as Health Hero for 2018, by Maria Shriver as an Architect of Change in 2016, and by Dr. Oz in ShareCare as the number one influencer online for Alzheimer's in 2012. You know, I was really scared to fail. I was kind of that control freak and that perfectionist. And what I learned was failure is just our path to success. It gets us a step closer. We have to reframe how we look at failure. You see, it's not about perfection. It's about progress, and we can't move forward if we're paralyzed in fear because we might not be good enough. We might not do good enough. We have to empower our children, our family, our friends, our coworkers, our employees, our society to make change, <laughs> to try to improve, and to give them accolades for doing that. 
instead of beating them up. We have to realize that we are much more alike than different. When we separate and think we're different, we create barriers and walls and enemies. When we true choose to see how similar we are, we create friendships in bonds and we move forward and we learn. And to me, life is all about learning. One of my biggest lessons my mother taught me was, what is the lesson? When I would get pushed against the wall, I would have to ask, what is the lesson? And you know what? When I asked that question, I found that I consciously was looking for the answer, and it would appear. Would you like to find an app so you can monitor your brain performance? It's called Roberto, named after Hall of Fame baseball player Roberto Clemente. I put it on my cell phone, but that's way too small for you to see, so I also put it on a big screen. My most recent session, I scored 285 points. Now the point is, after you get done with your test, you're going to get a result, and your goal is to have a result just as good, if not better, than yesterday. So we're ready to start the game. There's a disclaimer, no problem whatsoever. The first test is visual memory. Now here's the actual test. You have to remember bread, tree, ear, door, tooth, rat, fish, fork, and then it stops and it recycles so you can do that same test again. Do you remember what you saw on screen? Bread, tree, ear, door. Do you get the idea? Now you have to put it in your brain so you can remember it later on. Fish, fork, and that's the end of the first session. And then you move on to do more and more, and then at the end you are graded, you get a result. It's an amazing game, and I hope that you will sign up for it. And people all over the country are doing this. Roberto, the app. And at the end, you get a score, a base score. And the key is that you want to do just as good as yesterday. So with a high school athlete embedded in me, I always want to do better than I did yesterday. So how much does the Roberto app cost? They have a free trial for 15 days. And then if you want to continue, it's $2.99 a month. Before the Super Bowl in Minneapolis, Lori had a podcast with some of the leaders from Roberto, including former Vikings quarterback Gus Farratt. By using our game, we say well, you can warm up your brain for the day. Right, just like you need to warm up your body and do physical work. Let's warm up your brain a little bit and let's really see where you are. So that if I am a worker and people put a lot of trust in me, then maybe I need to take it a little slower today if my scores aren't right. Right. So we can break it down that it's a great thing for companies because we want to reduce accidents and injuries. And then it's a great thing for the individuals because a lot of people around you that are working with you trust you. And so we know that a lot of accidents that have happened can cause very serious injuries or even death. And so we wanna try and prevent those mental mistakes that happen by just letting you understand your brain a little bit better. A friend of mine, uh, who was a bit of a mentor for me in media, cause uh, I, I didn't have any training. They just put me out there and <laughs> talk about But a friend of mine, uh, who you know, Lori, cause he interviewed you years ago, uh, John Gross. And John, John, and I'm only sharing this because uh, he he uh, pounds his chest as a as a champion of Roberto. John's a dear friend. He retired, and he went from such a fast-paced life as a as a sports reporter, a sports anchor, a cameraman. He did it all over his his long and, and, and storied career. Uh, and and John uh, was struggling. And we met for coffee. And 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 I said, you got to check this out. That was in August. And John told me that he did Roberto every morning, every day, 
and it got it got him geared up because he was leaving the house and leaving the doors open. His wife and he would be talking about uh, their kids, and then he'd ask the same questions at dinner about the story he just heard. And and he realized that he wasn't stimulating himself like he had been for all of his career, and and so he was becoming uh, you know, frustrated and challenged and and and, and a little depressed. He loves Roberto. He swears by it. He, he told me emotionally that it, it literally impacted his life and changed his life. And so here, John goes from this tremendous career in, in sports uh, media to uh, frustration of shutting it down in his retirement to now using Roberto every day. And guess what? Our good friend and great storyteller, John, uh, went out and got involved in Toastmasters, and he, he went on to uh, regional and national level speeches. So here's a here's a guy that was frustrated with his memory, and now he's out giving rote speeches and winning awards uh, for for his skill sets there, and and he says he does Roberto every morning, and that's only been the last six months. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm proud of John. He's a great friend, but I, I get a little bit choked up on that story because he does. Mm -hmm. And when he shares it, and, and so I, I, I share that with you today, Lori, because he's a, he's a he's a friend of yours from uh, some of your engagements when he was in the media, interviewing mm -hmm. you as as an expert, and uh, and I share it with my RC Twenty One X teammates because it is a true testimonial, just like the gentleman with multiple sclerosis, and 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 John here, uh, who just needed to uh, get those synapses firing. And, and get himself going in the morning and and, uh, and and life has been better and that's that's what gets us excited is when when you can impact the quality of someone's life and they have total control yeah and and John is actually the one who introduced me to Roberto and you guys he's like you have to know I mean he was so excited he's <laughs> like you have to know about these guys you have to interview them this is fantastic it's changed my life I mean he's he he will be out there waving the flag forever for you guys. I mean, he's he's so excited about it. So, um, you know, we were hoping that John was going to be able to make it with us today, but it didn't work out with schedules. And um, but I, I'm I'm so thankful uh, that he he told me about this because I can't wait to help spread the word. My my mission in life is to teach every brain about the miracle that it is and it sits right between our ears and it's the single greatest most magnificent miracle ever designed um, and we've learned recently that it can be shaped based upon what we do and what we think and who we're with and so we can shape our brains for disease we can shape our brains for violence we see it every day on the news or we can shape our brains for health i've chosen health and I branded a lifestyle approach because lifestyle is still the most important thing we can do to promote health. It's not a pill, it's not a yogurt, it's not a handstand, it's not a gymnastic piece of equipment, it is lifestyle. Um, we are also the only animal on the planet who through a given thought can make, our, make ourselves miserable or happy from a thought. Think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. So this fits very, very well then with um, my meeting again with Clarence and, and learning about the RC21X and, and the Roberto app um, because it's really about, number one, getting everybody to be conscious about this miracle that's just between their ears, monitoring its output, which is cognitive and motor performance, uh, and then doing things to help promote the health. Uh, we've used the word prevention. I'm very much into health promotion. The only way we're going to get to health promotion, Lori, is that we got to make everybody conscious and informed of what sits between their ears, which is the foundation, the epicenter of their identity. I love that approach. Anybody in the world could come and get and download this app. Right now, we're being downloaded in over 140 countries. Um, people are using it. They really like it. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, the downloads that we're getting. And um, you, you'll be able to look at yourself and like Dr. Kondraski says from the University of Texas, the Human Performance Institute is, uh, you know, Clarence, this isn't just about one disease, injury, illness. It's about human performance and where you are at any given time. So it gives you that opportunity to always check on yourself. You know, you go to a doctor's office and the doctor never asks you, well, how's your brain doing today? Well, we're going to have data for that doctor, physician, clinician, to let, let him know how your brain is performing. And over time and over trend data that we collect in your 
your, your brain. When you're doing a test like this, it's not always just about finding dementia that you know isn't curable, but there are some forms where it, it you know we can um, we can change our habits or our ways. It could be stress induced. It could be lack of sleep. It could be um, you know vitamin deficiency. There's all different types of things, medications um, mixed together that that aren't complementing one another. Um, so it's a great way for us to be more conscious of what's going on in our own lives. Mm -hmm. And it's not only football, it's hockey. Mm -hmm. It's other things where there are concussions. Soccer, yes. Yep, and, and you know, the women are getting these um, concussions as well. It could be a car accident. It could be, um, you know, it could be abuse. It could be all kinds of things that can cause, uh, uh, you know, the CTE um, concussion type dementia. So, um, but again, if you have vascular dementia, frontal temporal lobe, Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body, um, this, the Roberto app is still ideal for you as well. Or if you just want to get a baseline for yourself to know how you're doing. And if you're seeing things change, maybe you want to bring it to the doctor and mm -hmm. show him. I remember you were asking her questions and she just wasn't responding at all. And then you had a music therapist that was there and it was amazing. And the same thing happened to Glenn Campbell. Mm -hmm. What about music? What can music do to refresh memories? Music is what music and arts is really one of the last things to go in our brain. And so a lot of times there'll be people who all of a sudden can paint that you never knew could paint, but their, their inhibitions are gone. They're not worried about people judging them anymore. They're much freer. And when you think about music, music is embedded in our souls. It, we have emotional reactions to songs. It makes us laugh, it makes us cry, it makes us remember certain moments and, and stages in our life. And that never goes away until the very, very end. And so music is extremely powerful, but it needs to be their music, not necessarily yours. <laughs> and it, it's amazing how some college students are picking on their flutes or whatever, and they're recording the music, taking it to the care center, putting earphones on people, and they come awake. It's coming alive. Almost. Yep. Yeah, there's actually uh, a film. You can see a portion of it on, on YouTube or pick it up on Netflix called Alive Inside. It'll show the power of music. And Dr. Uh, Dan Cohen um, it did this amazing study with headsets, and it's they're using it all around the country now. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. <laughs> you make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. You are my What are the warning signs? What do you see? How do you feel? When do you actually take action and go to a doctor? 
Well, every person is different, John, and that's what makes it difficult. Um, you know, I would say women tend to go into the doctor more so than men, you know, but, but that's just kind of a, a standard, you know, thing um, that we've always seen. And so, you know, more women are diagnosed than men with the disease. Um, and it's really when your life starts to change and symptoms mm. start to interfere with your ability to live fully. You know, that's when you need to go in because there are some normal aging issues, like we all forget where our keys are at times, but when we can't retrace our steps back to where we were to find them, you know, that's an issue. For some people, their math goes. All of a sudden, they just can't do any math. Um, some people, it's reading. Some people, it's their verbiage. So um, some, it's planning or not being able to do a task or a hobby that they've always done. Hmm. And so um, everybody is different, but I think it's good that there's a raised consciousness at this time. And um, I, I think some of the fear is reduced, not near to where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. um, but I think people aren't as ashamed as they used to be and they shouldn't be ashamed it's a disease it's you know it's not something that anybody can control and they're finding now that if you are having symptoms the disease process in your brain probably started 10 to 15 years before you even knew it this topic is near and dear to my heart five years ago <clears throat> i noticed some problems with memory so I took it maybe to the best hospital in the world. You know what I'm talking about, Mayo Clinic. And I took a three-hour test. It's a test for Alzheimer's. Oh, I could not believe this test. It was unbelievable. I remember one of the questions was, spell world backwards. <laughs> backwards, D-L-R-O-W. But I couldn't say it back then. But it, it was a warning to me, and it made me realize I did have a problem and I changed some lifestyle, and one of the lifestyle changes that I made has made a dramatic effect to me, and that's sleep. I went to the hospital and took a sleep apnea test, and I remember they, they put something on me and I didn't know what was going on, and I found out that I, I woke up 64 times in the middle of the night. So I started to get much better sleep, eight, 10 hours a day and it helped tremendously. Does sleep make a difference for someone who has Alzheimer's? Sleep is huge. In fact, I remember it was it probably six months ago, maybe nine months ago, uh, Dr. Rudy Tansy, who is just a spectacular neurologist and, and uh, investigator when it comes to dementia, and he said they found that sleep is huge, absolutely huge. And he joked, he said, you know, how he prided himself on being a multitasker and, and doing just fine on four or five hours of sleep. And he said, I've changed all that now. <laughs> and he makes sure he gets eight hours of sleep every single day now. And it makes a difference to everybody. I mean, this isn't just somebody, this yep. is everybody. And that could lead to warning signs that are not good. Well, part of it is, you know, when we're sleeping, our body is kind of rejuvenating itself. And when we're not sleeping, it, it, we don't allow it to heal and to rejuvenate cells. And so it's, it's very important, very important. Exercise is, a, is another one that is um, extremely important because as we exercise, we get more oxygen to our brain, you know, and they say what's good for the heart is good for good for the mind. Um, but one thing that I, I still don't think gets enough attention, and I'm no scientist, uh, I'm just a daughter, and I'm a, I'm a woman who has been very active in this field now for 10 years, but I think social engagement is huge. I, I think social engagement gives us purpose and passion and makes us feel connected, and when we don't have that, you know, we get depressed, we pull back, and we feel less than. That's and a I, common trait, huh? And I think um, I, I hear it from my my people that I work with that have dementia all the t all the time. They say, you know, life is different now, and I wouldn't wish this disease on anybody. But I have a purpose now in raising awareness, and I never had that before. And they know they're making a difference, and they all say they feel that that helps kind of stand off the the symptoms from getting worse. Is it true or not? Who knows? Could just be those individuals. Um, but, you know, heck, it's worth a shot. One of the things that, that really touched my hearts 
was something that, that Lori developed uh, in the area, and she's from Roseville, um, and it's called the Memory Cafe. And we did a story for Channel 5 on this, and the people just opened up, and it, it's a caregiver and the person who has Alzheimer's or dementia. Is that right? Can you describe that program? Sure. The, the Memory Cafe, I, I say it's kind of like a bowling league or a bridge club. You don't show up for the equipment. You show up for the camaraderie. Um, there's not an agenda. It's very fluid, and it's for people who are diagnosed or maybe having memory issues. Maybe they're not diagnosed yet. Um, and typically early to mid stages, and then their care partners. And care partners are typically family members, but that can also mean, um, you know, friends, or it could be, uh, you know, a hired home health care person. But we, we want them to be a consistent, um, I guess, couple or dyad, whatever you'd like <laughs> to refer to them as. Uh, it might be a son or a daughter. And then we talk about all of life. And dementia comes into play just like going on vacation does or kids visiting, um, somebody getting sick. We cover it all and we support everybody. And it's not about having all the answers as a facilitator. It's about allowing the group um, to brainstorm and share what's working, what's not working, and then stepping in. And, you know, you referred to me as an expert, and I say the people with dementia are, are the true experts. What I'm really excited about is in, you know, 2013, John, I was lucky enough to work with the Lutheran Home Association, and we launched the first dementia-friendly community here in the U.S. And like the Memory Cafe, that was a concept that came from overseas and people told us we couldn't do it and it would never happen and it needed to be structured it needed to kind of be a bed and a bag and um, I said I'm just gonna start I, I think I think we are so far beyond the eight ball when it comes to dementia we, um, we progress is is more important than perfection and we just need to get out and try new things and try to do better and so um, since then, we got you know great coverage with that. Um, a lot of communities have started their own dementia-friendly um, groups. Roseville, Minnesota, is mm -hmm. one of them that has really looked highly upon um, around the country and the world. We actually have the city of Roseville has dedicated us space on their website for our group. Uh, we did a, a fabulous um, program on travel. So it and it, it outlines people to help them know how to how to leave the house if they're going to the bank, if they're going for a drive, if they're going um, to a wedding or a family function, or maybe they're going out of state or even out of the country. We've covered it all. These are the things that you need to take with you um, to have a successful trip, and we put tons of hours into that and. It was just an honor to be part of that group who did that. And then they just updated all the forms. Those are all available online for people. We want to share everything that we do. We want to make it easier. It's not about having people recreate the wheel, but that's what's so cool about both the memory cafes and Dementia Friendly. Nobody really owns it. Um, you know, the grassroots portions, it's just, it's out there. There's also um, Dementia Friendly America, which is actually kind of the mothership that, that sprung out of um, Act on Alzheimer's, which was Minnesota-based as well, mm -hmm. too. And I found a book just a week ago that I really like. It's by Maria Sh uh, Shriver, and it's called Color My Mind. What do you think about that book? Well, I just happened to bring that one with me. Um, this is a fabulous book, and I, I adore Maria Shriver. You know, I worked with her on her Move for Minds. I was lucky enough to be invited out um, about a year ago. To you be, actually to, met her? Yeah, to be on a panel um, of experts out in California. And she has a she has a couple of things. She's just a phenomenal woman. She has a Move for Minds where they... Um, they go around to multiple cities and they're going to go international next year and it'll have um, they do some exercise a lot of times it's in a um, in a particular um, community I, i'm i'm losing my words here <laughs> <laughs> funny funny um it, but they will they will host it um at at uh, an exercise community they will have um, different vendors they'll have some healthier foods and then they'll have an expert panel 
and so that was just amazing to be part of that and she has all the videos you can hear all these different professionals speak were you um, able to talk uh, to her one-on-one -on -one? yeah 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 i got my picture taken <laughs> with her and the whole nine yards in fact i'm hoping um when i'm in um la in october i'm hoping to meet up with her again we're trying to get our schedules together but but this book is absolutely fabulous another thing that she has which is greater than dementia, but I think so supportive. And she puts out a Sunday paper every Sunday. And she... Um, and where, where can you see this? You can get it online. If you put in Move for Minds, you'll you'll find it there. I don't want to miss uh, misspeak on her, her company. Um, but she is, she does this Sunday paper, and it is filled with inspiring stories. She talks about people, the architects of change, which I was honored to be one of those as well. Um, she has uh, print, uh, printed articles and she has videos and she has quotes. And she always starts out with her personal insights and struggles. And she's so authentic and so vulnerable. Um, she's just one of the nicest, kindest ladies and she's making a huge difference in the space of dementia and her goal with her organization is to fund more research of why are more women getting this than men. We must chart a bold and brave new course. We must engage new minds, uncover new ways of thinking, discover new approaches. So come on, help take Alzheimer's down. Help us win this war. Win it before it wipes out every mind on the planet. I have the star panel, superstar panel of all the eight cities today. Lori LeBay uh, is a real passionate advocate. She created a thing called Alzheimer Speaks and she has these um, care cafes and these real outlets for people who are diagnosed and their caregivers to have a voice because in case you guys haven't noticed, um, a lot of people with Alzheimer's disease are marginalized and don't have enough of a voice. What's your big message? My big message is shifting uh, caregiving from crisis to comfort. I think we all deserve that. Uh, one of the things that I think we really have to um, take into account though is our verbiage that we use. So even though I use the word caregiver, I would really encourage people to switch to care partner or care companion. Caregiver sets up that crisis state. It says, I'm giving everything away, I'm not getting anything back. But being a care partner or a care companion says, we're in relationship, they're still here. And that is so critical. My personal journey was with my mom who had dementia for 30 years and people go, oh, that's amazing. And I'm like, you're gonna see a lot more of that with early diagnosis and more conversations and people becoming aware. And that is a good thing. My mom's journey was the biggest gift I'll ever receive in my life. And most people don't look at illness as that even being possible, but it, it made me a better person. It made me be more conscious. It made me uh, slow down and let go of all the crap I can't control, but I've been told I can. And, and that's a gift so huge. It's, it's taught me to connect on different levels, to go within, to find peacefulness, and to um, really push to raise everyone's voice. So some of the things that I have done when I created Alzheimer Speaks was, bottom line, I broke every business rule there was because I didn't want to work in a broken system. And so I created Alzheimer Speaks to raise everyone's voice, and I mean everyone's. That means the person with dementia, that means the family caring for them or, or a friend. That means business professionals, doctors, means authors, movie directors, everybody in this room has the power to improve our dementia care culture. Every single one of us, we can look at this as a crisis or we can look at it as a gift. And we, we have forgotten, I think, in society, our, our power of one and the impact that we have uh, through the radio show, through something called Dementia Chats, which is where I interview people a couple times a month and video it, and all this stuff is free on the website. My experts have dementia. Who better to ask than somebody living with the disease? What do they want out of life? What are their perceptions of the disease? What, what do they want us to change? We need to have these conversations. They have wonderful insights, 
great hope. You really have to work together. Don't talk enough about our social interactions, memory cafes, the, the, the just having the conversations, um, keeping your connections. And we don't really talk a lot about emotional toxins or stress and the effect that that has on our bodies and, and how we interact with one another. And um, I think that the meditations, the exercise, everything everyone's talking about, I, I think is really powerful, but we have to remember who we are um, as a community and, and be in relationship because isolation is such a huge factor with this disease. And, you know, being connected is another way of keeping our minds active. With my journey with my mom of 30 years, she taught me so many lessons. Everybody in our life, there are lessons to be learned if we're open to learning them. And that's why I think it's so important to stay socially active. Look into the memory cafes. We're actually doing a cruise this November for people with early memory loss in their families. And we're going to have a symposium. But it's all about creating moments moments of joy, you're not going to find what you don't look for. You know, I used to be the, um, the queen of checklists and caring for my mom, which probably many of you are. And we're, we feel empowered when we check off our list. Um, it makes us feel good because we're out of control. But I found that I had to switch from my, my list of to-dos to three simple things to really improve my interaction and my peacefulness within. And that was before every interaction, if it was on the phone, if it was in person, whatever, I had to ask myself, is she safe, is she happy, and is she pain-free? When I focused on that, it changed everything in terms of how I do my tasks. Some I found I didn't need to do. Some I found I, I could actually let somebody else do it or ask for help. Um, but it allowed me to be a daughter again. You see, our care culture, to me, is our most powerful tool we have in terms of changing our culture. But we can't use it if we don't even have the conversation. Now, care culture, I didn't even know what it was, didn't have a clue about it, until my mom ventured on a 30-year journey with dementia. And that changed my life. But her disease, I believe, is the biggest gift I'll ever receive in my life because she taught me so many beautiful, simple lessons. And what I found was every single one of those lessons is applicable to all of my life and all of yours and at all ages. What's good for dementia is really good for everyone. So I want to share a few things with you on what I learned. The first thing I learned, and I believe this really strongly, is that we are able to give and receive care from the moment we're conceived. Now most of you are going to argue with me and go, come on, Lori, how can a baby in a womb give or receive care? But I challenge you, how many bellies have you patted? How many tummies have you talked to? How many conversations and outcomes have changed because of a belly in a womb? We are connected on deeper levels than what we ever have realized. And we have to start consciously caring and accepting our power of one, our impact on one another. Because that's, that's how we get hope. That's how we collaborate. That's how we gather strength and make true positive changes. In wrapping up, I have to share one story with you. And it has to do with the chicken, Betty the bald chicken. You see, Betty lived on this farm and she had this brilliant, brilliant life. She was connected to family and friends, and one day she was out on the farm nibbling on some corn, and she felt this tug and this pull. And she looked around, and nobody was by her, but her shoulder hurt, and she had this gut feeling her life was about to change. And then she bowed her head to eat, and she saw one feather had fallen. She decided not to tell anybody about it, because what the heck do you say? And about three months later, she was out in the barnyard again eating, 
And she felt this tug and this pull, but this time she squawked out in pain. And when she did, all the other animals turned and looked at her. And she saw the fear in their eyes. And she saw them literally pushing her away and pulling their young back. And from that point forward, no one would have anything to do with her. And she bowed her head and she cried. And she felt ashamed. And as she looked down, she saw all these feathers scattered around, and she saw that her body was bloody and pockmarked. And she walked off into the outskirts of the farm, and she cried these crocodile tears in pain. And her eyes were blurred, and she tripped on a rock, and she fell off this big cliff into this ravine, and she's screaming on her way down, thinking, no one's even going to know that I'm gone. Nobody cares. But what she didn't know was at the bottom of the ravine was a whole nother community called the Karen Corral. And they whisked her in, and they never asked her a question about what was wrong. You see, this story tells us that most of us, if we're honest, have been Betty. We've been pushed away and shunned. Most of us have walked away from someone in need, and most of us are part of the Karen Corral. It's what moment will we continue to live in? Thank you very much for your time. Has this ever happened to you? You get up in the morning and you can't find your glasses. You look in the bedroom, you look in the basement, you look in the kitchen, and you can't find your glasses. Here's the solution. It's a glasses strap. You get six for $8.88 at Amazon.com. Put it around your neck, and you know where it is all day long. Here's a game changer. You get a box like this, and you put what you need for the morning in the box. You put your billfold and your comb and your glasses and your keys and whatever you need for the morning, put it in the blue box. Put it on your dresser in the bedroom. You get up in the morning and everything's waiting for you. I wanna share some gifts that I learned on my mom's journey with dementia that have been life-changing for me. They not only apply to my journey with her, but my whole life. And if we pay attention while we're walking alongside someone, you too can learn these gifts that will enhance your lives and everyone who enters yours. Um, the first one was acceptance. Letting go of control and, and realizing that I can't change my mom's symptoms. I can't change that she has this disease. In doing that, it allowed me to see her and accept her for who she is in the moment. And it allowed me to be who I was in that moment. Another gift that she gave me was learning to play again. Because as an adult, we get a little too serious. And, and relishing in the small little things that melt our heart. Not the big flashy things, but just the small little things. She taught me the gift of, of just being, of, of letting go of expectations and trying to control a situation. She taught me the gifts of, of allowing others into the space, that everybody, everywhere, no matter who they are, has something to give us, something to teach us, something to calm us. But we can't receive those gifts if we don't allow them into our lives. She taught me the gift of, of being inclusive in all ages, in all ranges, in all colors, in all shapes and sizes. She taught me the gift of gratitude, of truly appreciating what is in my life today, what I have had in my life and what is possible, which is basically everything. She taught me the gift of creativity, of spontaneity, of letting go of control, and most important, letting go of my ego. Allowing, allowing, allowing my need to feel like I have all the answers. 
She allowed me to connect to a higher power and to have a relationship with her that was so much deeper and wider and broader than anything I ever imagined. She taught me that I'm more than a name, that you're more than a name, and that our words matter. But more than that, it's, it's not about what we do. It's not about even necessarily how we do it but it's about how we make people feel. Are they safe? Are they happy? Are they pain-free? Do they feel joy and comfort with us? Do we help them spin in a realm of creativity, possibilities, belongings? Do we empower them to live alongside us? Do we allow them to still give to us? They can't give to us if we, if we set up an expectation that they can't do that anymore. People with dementia are brilliant, and their voices need to be heard, and their actions and their nonverbals need to be read, because three quarters of our communication is nonverbal. So we have to learn to consciously care, to be present, and to allow not only ourselves but others in our lives to be themselves. My mom taught me many lessons through her journey. The biggest and over, overwhelming one was that we need to be conscious of our care culture. We need to really think about our actions and our non-actions, how they impact ourselves and how they impact others. She taught me that we each have this great and beautiful thing called the power of one to make a difference, to put a smile on someone's face, to remove their fear, and to just sit and revel in the comfort of one another. She taught me to kick my ego to the curb and be more accepting, be more patient, be more spontaneous in play. Because you see, the detours in life sometimes are the most beautiful places we'll ever go. She taught me that what's good for dementia is good for all of the world. And there is no right or wrong way to live a life, even though many of us think there is. There are so many unique possibilities. There is so much beauty when we look at the similarities between each of us as humans versus focusing on our differences. There is so much fun and joy to be had, but we will never have it in our life if we don't look for it, if we don't create it, if we don't put down our phones and walk away from our computers and really look somebody in the eye, touch them, talk with them, look at their nonverbals, not just what are the words they're using, but what is their body language saying us? What are they teaching us? What do they have to offer? You see, I believe everybody has something to teach the world every day in every moment. But it's up to us to consciously care and to know that we have that power within us to change somebody's world. Even if it's just for a few seconds, that is a beautiful gift that you can give somebody. And when you do that, it fills your heart. So learn to consciously care, learn to play again, learn to live a fluid life, one that doesn't necessarily know the outcomes, but just know that there are brilliant opportunities for all of us to enrich our lives, to enrich ourselves, to teach our children. Be respectful. We've kind of lost that in our culture. Be kind. Let one of your main focuses be not what are you doing, but how do you make other people feel? I know that you have probably a hundred different stories you could tell. We were running out of time. <laughs> but do you have maybe a two or three minute story that touches your heart, my heart, and anybody that's watching? My mom at the time was living in a nursing home and they were having this big, wonderful picnic, and my daughter went up there with me, and my daughter was with my mom, and I was running around helping getting people out in wheelchairs. And I kept looking over, and they were having a good time. They were laughing and giggling, and it was just 
good fun. And as I'm just rolling out my last person, putting their brakes on, I hear my mom scream out, I hate you, I hate you, leave me alone, I hate you. <laughs> and I look at my daughter, and my daughter has these just crocodile tears coming down her face and her lips quivering. And she comes running to me, and my mom is beat red in the face and mad, and she's still screaming. And my daughter says, Mom, I didn't hurt Grandma, I didn't hurt Grandma, I never hurt Grandma. I said, honey, what happened? She says, we were, we were having a good time, and we were talking and laughing, and she had, the, she had this cookie, and a, a piece fell on her chest, so I just picked it up. That's all I did, Mom. That's all I did. And I said, honey, we need, to, we need to go back and figure out exactly what happened. She's like, well, I just told you. And I said, no, we need to back it up. What were you doing before you picked up the cookie? Well, um, she says, well, we were talking and laughing. And I said, okay, so you were talking and laughing. Did you have eye contact with Grandma? Well, of course I had eye contact with Grandma. <laughs> well, were you holding her hand? Well, I always hold Grandma's hand. I said, so you were talking and laughing. You were holding Grandma's hand, and you had eye contact. I said, what caused you to pick up the cookie? And she said, well, I guess there was a break in the conversation. And I said, okay, so there's a break in the conversation. So you weren't talking and laughing anymore. I said, were you still holding Grandma's hand? And she said, well, no, you know, she's in that big Jerry wheelchair, and I was sitting down, and I stood up, and no, I guess I let go of her hand. And I said, okay, so you weren't talking and laughing, and you weren't holding her hand. I said, um, did you still have eye contact? And she looked at me, and her mouth kind of dropped, and she said, well, well, no, Mom. I had to look at the cookie. I said, honey, you lost three powerful connections. You, you mm -hmm. weren't talking and laughing. You weren't holding her hand, and you didn't have eye contact. And in that nanosecond, you reached in, and you touched her in an appropriate spot for a stranger. I said, that is why she you know, yelled out at you. She was scared. That was not appropriate. And you know, I, I I always tell my audiences, if you have ever had um, a good masseuse, they will always leave one hand on you because they don't want to break the connection. And it is critical. It is critical. Our energy fields are connected. And, you know, those little things are so simple to, to change. Welcome to Dementia Chat. My name is Mike Wallenbuggen. I am 58 years old. I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at age 49 after struggling for 10 years to get a diagnosis. I now spend my time advocating. I really need a routine in order for my mind to settle down. But it's a, a constant learning experience for everyone involved. Uh, I, I used to hate having a routine. Uh, I, I found that very boring. However, since my uh, Alzheimer's, I, I feel so much more comfortable following a routine and doing the same thing over and over. Well, I'm not going to tell them until we're ready to go because they're going to get all upset about the thing. Well, I think they're going to get more upset about it if they don't know what's coming. It's very important that if you have somebody who tends to forget, to mention it to them multiple times. Hey, we're going to do this at 3 o'clock. We're going to go out and do this and just keep reminding them because that, I believe, will make things better rather than worse. Lori LeBay is from Roseville. I predict that you're going to go on a, on a rocket here in, <laughs> in as far as Alzheimer's dementia research. You got what it takes. Your speeches are amazing. Your your interview was fantastic. I'm so glad that I could talk to you. And I protect really, really big things because Alzheimer's is a hot topic. And you have information that will help people. You helped me today. I'm so glad I invited you. And how can people get a hold of you? So Alzheimer's Speaks dot com um, or Lori at Alzheimer's Speaks or you can always call me too if you'd like six five one seven four eight four seven one four. I didn't expect that. <laughs> you were a phone call away to talking to the expert on Alzheimer's. <laughs> Lori, you were fantastic. I'm so glad we did this show. Oh, thank you so much for having me, John. Yes. It's always a pleasure. And for you watching, thank you, and please join us again. I'm John Gross.